Good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to this very first webinar of this uh, EOI annual conference. Today is the third day of this conference. The conference offers various highlights in terms of legal scholarship and wider legal discourse already. Today, a series of webinars is going to start, which covers highly relevant legal topics and brings together first class experts from legal practice and scholarship. Please allow me to introduce myself as chair of this webinar. My name is Jens Peter Schneider, and I'm professor of public law at the University of Freiburg in the southwest of Germany. Today, I'm wearing two hats, as I'm not only chair of this webinar, but also one of the reporters of the ELI project we will discuss in the next 75 minutes. And I would now like to see the presentation. Thank you very much. As you can see from this slide, our webinar will present and discuss, discuss one of the most recent ELI projects, which has been adopted by the ELI Council in early May 2020, so very recently. The project deals with artificial intelligence and public administration and aims at developing model rules for impact assessments before the implementation of AI applications by public bodies. Thus, it is important to keep in mind that the project and the envisaged model rules will not cover public regulation of private usage of AI applications. Processing of data and information is fundamental to the work of public administrations. New technologies such as AI can play a significant role in the modernization and overall improvement of the functioning of public administration. On the other hand, it is equally important to guarantee the transparency, correctness and security of the processed data as well as to ensure the respect of the rule of law and especially the rights of European citizens and businesses. Public administration is, as a result, confronted with specific opportunities and challenges in the deployment of AI and more generally the deployment of automatic decision making systems. Whether or not they use specific AI technologies such as machine learning or not. The use of these techniques pose specific problems related to the particular requirements associated with the principle of good administration. A major component of a legal framework adapted to challenges accompanied with any public implementation of AI tools could be a rigorous as well as proactive AI impact assessment. Thus, it is obvious to me and hopefully to many of you that the topic of our webinar is highly relevant. The agenda of our webinar combine, combines three elements. First, a presentation of the overall project, the drafting team, and two specific topics which the drafting team discussed during the first weeks after the ELI Council adoption of the project, i.e. the general structure of or architecture of an impact assessment for AI applications, as well as adequate options for expert involvement and public participation. And I'm very grateful to Katarzyna Zygolska from the University of Warsaw and to Jonathan Dollinger, who is a member of my own AI team at Freiburg, that they share with me the responsibility to inform you about the state of thinking within our drafting team. The second element of our webinar consists of statements by distinguished members of the project's advisory committee. The whole drafting team is very honored that the president of the Curia, which is the Supreme Court of Hungary, Peter Darat, and my distinguished colleague from Stockholm University, Jane Raphael, will share their views on the topic and our project with us. I'm more than sure that both of them will provide us with extremely helpful and probably also challenging perspectives. Welcome and many thanks 
for your participation. Kuznam Shepen, Taksa Miket. The final stage of our seminar will be an open discussion among all of us. As our online format provides us with very convenient tools, I would like to invite you already at this stage to participate in our discussion by posing questions via the Zoom Q&A function described in the technical guide which you received after registering for the seminar. In order to keep within our tight time frame, I will now directly start with the presentation of the project team and I will be as short as possible. As you can learn from the slide, the project team is chaired by my Polish colleague, Professor Marek Wierzbowski. And I'm more than happy to be a reporter of this project together with Marc Lemont, judge at the Administrative Court of Lyon, and my colleague from Oxford University, Paul Craig. I'm sure that all of them are very well known to you. In addition, the drafting team consists of senior scholars of law and computer science, which are Franz Merli from Vienna, Olivia Tambou from Paris Dauphin, and Daniel Le Metaillet from the French National Institute for Research in Computer Science, as well as our three younger researchers from Freiburg and Warsaw, partly accompanying myself today. A major factor of success will be the astonishing high number of excellent experts from various national and professional backgrounds who volunteer to serve as members of either our advisory board or our members consultative committee. The drafting team will organize with the support of the ELI Secretariat online workshops with both bodies in October and November this year as the next step after contemplating about the input from today's webinar. Obviously, the project deals with a very innovative legal topic. Nevertheless, impact assessments are already part of a regulatory toolbox, either in other specific fields of law, like the protection of personal data or the environment, or in other countries like Canada and the US. The project team analyzed these examples intensively during its first workshops and will draw on such existing models. We identified common structures as well as interesting variations or differences, for instance, concerning the need of external permissions. We discuss, uh, discovered also room for improvement and are discussing various options for combining the best elements from these models with new ideas developed by our team. In addition, we are taking into account various other sources of inspiration listed on the slide and beyond that list. As every good architect, the drafting team started its work after the positive EOI Council decision by taking a step back in order to see the broader picture and to develop the general structure of an adequate impact assessment for public use of AI applications, or more generally, automatic decision-making systems. As we are still in the initial period of the project, this general structure, as well as other points presented by Jonathan and Katarzyna, are still preliminary and will be a matter of discussion, especially with the advisory committee and the MCC. Now, I would like to ask Jonathan to proceed and to present our most recent ideas about this general structure, which deviates in some respects from the initial draft report presented to the Enlarged Council and distributed to you before this webinar. Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and good morning. I am delighted to be here and to introduce the structure of our model rules. Our model rules would apply to public authorities using automated decision-making systems. According to our preliminary definition, an automated decision-making system is any computer technology that either assists or replaces the judgment of human decision-makers. This is a broad definition. The term does not only cover artificial intelligence. Our proposal also includes more conventional systems that, unlike AI, are not able to learn independently. 
This is because conventional systems can also pose risks. In addition, there are many competing definitions of AI and many systems are described as AI, even though from a technical perspective, they may be not. Therefore, we would like to avoid that term in order to prevent misunderstandings. Our definition also includes systems that merely assist human decision makers, because such systems can still heavily influence the final human made decision. Under our model rules, artificial, automated decision making systems would fall into one of three categories. A first annex, here called Annex 1 on the right of the slide, would include systems that are always subject to an impact assessment. These are systems that are particularly risky, such as facial recognition software. The second category would be systems listed in Annex 2 on the left that are never subject to an impact assessment. These might be systems that are already widely used and are known to pose no risk, such as automatic spell checkers. The decision whether to put a system into an annex is primarily a political decision, which we would ultimately leave to the competent legislature. All systems that are not covered by either annex would be subject to a preliminary risk analysis. In the language of environmental impact assessment, we may call it a screening procedure. If this screening reveals that there is only a low risk, the system may be used immediately. The public authority would still publish the results of the screening procedure in order to provide some transparency. However, if there is at least a medium risk, an impact assessment will be necessary. As the first step of the impact assessment, the authority that would like to use the system would have to create a report in which it describes the impacts of the system. A central issue to be investigated would be the system's impact on fundamental rights. Typically, data protection and privacy should be important concerns, but they are not the only human rights that may be at stake. For instance, some versions of predictive policing software do not use personal data but might still discriminate against ethnic minorities. The assessment should also cover societal concerns, such as possible impacts of the system on democracy or the environment. In addition, the report would describe what measures the public authority plans to take to ensure transparency and accountability. Furthermore, the assessment should evaluate the effectivity and efficiency of the use of the AI system and look for ways to improve it. A legal compliance check would be part of the report, but it is important to stress that the impact assessment goes beyond the mere compliance check. If the report grades the system as medium risk, the public authority would merely have to publish its report with possible reductions for the protection of trade secrets and other sorts of secrets. Then the public authority can use the system. If, however, the report grades the system as high risk, or if the system was listed in the annex of particularly risky systems I mentioned earlier, our model rules would require an independent expert board audit and a public participation period. After these consultations, the public authority would update the report and reply to the comments made during the consultation period. It is also possible and indeed desirable to update the system itself after the feedback given by experts and the public. Of course, the public authority might also decide not to use the system after all. Using the information gained from the impact assessment, the public authority might conclude that the cost of using the system would outweigh the benefits. Now, Katarzyna is going to talk in more detail about the expert board and public participation. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm very glad to be here today um, to talk a little bit more about those two points, public participation and expert audit. So the bottom line for this part of presentation is that using higher risk AI systems by public administration requires a higher level of scrutiny. Therefore, as it was previously shown on the scheme, our impact assessment uh, structure provides for 
in case of those systems, two additional steps, expert audit and, and public consultation. In our opinion, that combination of expertise and diverse civil involvement should enable more precise forecasting of problems, potential problems arising from the use of so-called risky AI in the public sector. So when a public authority wishes to um, deploy a system that has been graded, marked as a high risk system, it needs to turn to the expert board for evaluation. This step should take place uh, ideally after the completion of the impact assessment report, but prior to its publication. The subject of the expert evaluation is the impact assessment report itself. So it's overall quality, accuracy, adequacy, and completeness. The expert then can point out to the authorities some missing elements or data, some unforeseen risks, insufficient measures to protect the public, or any additional concerns to be addressed by the authority prior to, to the implementation of the system. In order to enable professional and impartial audit, the expert board and experts uh, should meet certain requirements and criteria for the appointment that will be set, uh, set out in our model rules. For example, the requirement of diversity or sufficient level of expertise. The expert board should be able to deliver recommendations to the authority indicating areas of impact assessment that uh, need improvement of or additions. And finally, the expert should prepare the audit report. This document, along with the impact assessment report, should then be published and subjected to public consultation. Under our model rules, second important step is uh, in the impact assessment process for high risk systems uh, is providing the general public with first of all information on the system as well as giving the opportunity and tools to express concerns and opinions. Uh, in our opinion it should be valuable for the authority to gain insights from individuals, communities, other designated authorities or non-governmental organizations. It should help anticipate potential problems and controversies arising from the deployment of the high-risk um, AI systems and address them beforehand before anything happens. Uh, in order to ensure transparency of the process, two main documents, as I mentioned, impact assessment report and the audit report, should be made publicly available. In our work, we also use the term public concern in order to, to stress the importance of the actual stakeholders, so people who might be influenced by, by the working of the, of the high-risk AI system, um, in the whole process of conducting this impact assessment. They should be given, in our opinion, real and effective opportunity to submit comments and questions, and then the public authority should be given opportunity and sufficient time to respond to those comments. The entire process, as I mentioned, should be transparent and as accessible as possible. Uh, now, now I will give the floor back to Jens Peter, who will present some of the issues that our project team is yet to explore in details. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan and Katarzyna. On our last slide, we listed questions which need to be addressed by the project team during our next meetings. I would especially like to highlight the first two topics on this list first. In the field of environmental law, the impact assessment builds on a report written by the private or public project developer. But the next steps of the procedure and especially the final evaluation of the report in the light of the expert statements and public participation are conducted by another administrative authority as a neutral body. In contrast, the data protection impact assessment according to Article 35 GDPR, is conducted by the data controller and the data protection supervisory authority will be informed only under specific conditions laid down in Article 36. Similarly, the Canadian rules on public use of AI establish impact assessments mainly as a tool for self-reflection of an authority implementing AI 
and other tools for automated decision making with limited inter-administrative po supervisory powers of a specific high-ranking body. At the moment, the drafting team tends to the second model with a focus on self-regulation and limited supervisory powers. With regard to substance, the standards of assessment are central. We are exploring the wide-ranging discussion, including the reports of the EU high-level group, expert group on AI, as well as the Commission's white paper on AI. I have a feeling that a legal framework, like our envisaged model rules, needs to be clearer than typical ethical guidelines. Nevertheless, it may not be easy to provide legal certainty in the evolving field of AI applications. Certainly, our list of questions is not exhaustive. Therefore, I'm very eager to hear the statements of our other distinguished panelists, President Peter Darak and Professor Reichel, in order to leave as much time as possible for our Q&A phase I skip any further information about our excellent legal experts and to refer in this regard to the conference brochure. President Darak, please take the floor and present your insight about AI and public administration. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, can you listen to me? Okay, thanks. Uh, I great this project of the uh, uh, European Law Institute because it's highly uh, time to uh, to uh, deal with uh, uh, artificial intelligence in the in the world of uh, law uh, because we are a bit conservative in technical issues uh, as lawyers and uh, we uh, are always afraid of uh, new innovations in the world of law. Uh, but nowadays uh, in uh, these months of uh, COVID pandemic, uh, I think uh, there is a good opportunity to uh, increase uh, the technical innovation in uh, the world of law uh, in the world of lawyers too. Uh, and uh, we also can see uh, that the state administration uh, tries to increase the uh, 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 efficient, efficient administration uh, with the help of new technologies uh, like AE. Um, uh, we see a lot of uh, documents of the uh, OECD, of the European Commission, uh, uh, dealing with uh, these problems. Uh, and my first uh, uh, idea uh, was when I read uh, these documents that uh, we are staying at uh, uh, our old approach um, of problems. We try to find uh, um, the original uh, human value of uh, law uh, behind these new technologies. Uh, it's not a coincidence that uh, the first documents uh, deal with uh, human rights relations uh, or uh, ethical approach of the problems, because uh, we are accustomed to, to analyze problems uh, from this point of view. Uh, but uh, my first question would be uh, whether uh, does it really help to uh, summarize uh, these, these old approaches um, on the field of the artificial intelligence? Uh, can we translate our uh, old traditional problems to the digital common language? Uh, is, uh, is there a real a bridge between specialists of IT and lawyers? when we can, uh, without misunderstandings, uh, translate our intentions or, or tasks to the uh, language of uh, softwares? It's a big question, and uh, I think we have to uh, speak about uh, together with specialists of uh, IT. 
the second uh, remark of me would be, uh, we speak about uh, this very trendy artificial intelligence, but uh, when we see uh, the uh, efforts of uh, state administration in, in various uh, nations, uh, we see uh, most of these uh, automatized uh, uh, technologies uh, are not really uh, artificial intelligence. They are more uh, simple algorithm. Uh, so uh, we speak about uh, intelligence, but we use only technology uh, for enhancing the effectivity of, of the administration. Um, the whole project uh, uh, concentrate uh, how to uh, introduce a new technology, a new system which uh, works with uh, algorithm, with uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, but uh, I uh, heard less about the permanent oversee of the systems. I think uh, that's the second uh, uh, point of view uh, could uh, work the project with. Uh, because if, you, if we see very special areas of law uh, in the everyday life, like uh, that data protection, like competition law, like consumer protection, everywhere we will find an authority which is specialized for this special area of law and they, uh, they are acting permanently as uh, supervising uh, authorities uh, in the field. So I support very much uh, uh, the impact assessment approach because that's a, a wonderful tool in the environment, although we know each other it. Uh, and I also uh, appreciate very much the idea uh, to use in the very highly risk uh, um, areas uh, an external audit. That's uh, a big uh, um, finding of the uh, tax law uh, to have audit and the uh, uh, finding of accounts uh, to have external audit. That's also a very nice idea. But all of these approaches concentrate on, the, on how to introduce a new system. But we will need uh, a special uh, authority to oversee the practice, the everyday practice of uh, algorithm, uh, especially because uh, these, are, these programs are uh, uh, have the character of, uh, of self-development. So at uh, the moment it will be introduced, we can't uh, see uh, how it will uh, work later uh, after a process of uh, self-development. Uh, the second uh, experience of me when we meet in uh, court procedures uh, with uh, uh, complicated uh, softwares and systems and uh, there were some uh, thousands of uh, processes in Hungary uh, in loan uh, credit cases, uh, bank cases, where we had to check how the computer calculates uh, 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 the period uh, of loan and uh, we need, we, we had really big difficulties uh, to understand how does it work. And that's not an uh, artificial intelligence system, that's only a simple algorithm. So when we connect all of the protection of, uh, of uh, subject of, uh, of uh, uh, AI to uh, traditional protection processes as court procedures, uh, there will be uh, a lot of uh, difficulties to understand what's about. We will need uh, a special expert circle to help uh, for uh, low protection. So uh, when we uh, concentrate on the permanent protection uh, against this new system, which are very useful and uh, 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 which uh, 
makes the life of state administration much better, um, we have to think about uh, uh, how we uh, integrate uh, the everyday life of these systems uh, to the court system, to the uh, law protection systems. Uh, for example, in Hungary, there is a system of uh, uh, automized uh, decision-making in speeding cases. These are little crimes. Uh, and there are uh, special cameras on the routes, on the motorways, and uh, without uh, uh, any human um, influence, uh, the decision will be made and will be sent to the uh, driver. Uh, there is a problem how, how we can uh, protect uh, people uh, against wrong decisions in this case. Um, there is an, uh, an interesting idea in, in, in these documents about uh, the, the red button. When uh, uh, we can take out the case from the automized uh, system, uh, perhaps that can be uh, a solution uh, for this problem. Uh, and. Uh, we have to deal with uh, this opportunity in all AI governed procedure uh, that uh, we have to create the opportunity to take out the case from the system. And uh, uh, this uh, pilot case uh, could then uh, show us uh, whether uh, all the requirements are fulfilled in the uh, computer-governed decision-making or not. Uh, so these are my first ideas about the project, which uh, I, I agree to very much. And I'm delighted to uh, be a person who uh, could give uh, uh, false advices uh, to this excellent committee. Thank you very much. President Dahat, thank you so much for your inspiring comments. And uh, I have a feeling that Jane will take uh, some of those and uh, even deeper our insights in that. And so the floor is yours, Jane. Thank you very much. Um, uh, now I've unmuted myself and I see, I'm trying to see if I can share my slides. Um, I'm not sure I am being successful. Are you seeing them now? Yes. Good, very good. So here we go. Um, uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation to participate in this highly interesting seminar, uh, digital as it is, which is also very, uh, uh, illustrative for, for how we work today and how we use technique in communications in several different manners. So I would like to uh, raise some points and, uh, and, and, and shed some light on what I have found to be very interesting and also thought provoking in this project. Um, so my, my, my a bit too long heading was for is form and function of an effective impact assessment, how to secure the internal market and uphold national administrative requirements. And I, I do have two rather contradictory remarks here um, that I, I would very much like to hear how you um, plan to address these. And they, these are, of course, a very wide questions. Uh, that are very general for EU administrative uh, law, uh, but still I think they're also important in this context. Um, there might be need to have nationally adapted and also iterative evaluations, as I understand your project, uh, for these uh, uh, decision-making um, uh, uh, services and so that is on the one hand that the assessment needs to be to take into account perhaps also nat nationally adapted uh, variations and be repetitive in some some way uh, on the one hand and on the other hand there is always a risk for regulatory overload that will drown any IA project and also become an important obstacle to the internal market uh, and as I said, this is something that is already 
uh, happening now. The, this is, uh, the EU has been rather active in developing uh, different IT platforms and, and uh, digital uh, helps and services for the, for the member states. And already today we see a lot of these problems arising. Uh, so this project is still in the early stage and, and, and we've seen from your introductions that uh, steps will have to be defined. Um, so we'll see how this develops. Um, if we start with the, the question of standard of assessments that was also brought uh, uh, to your attention in, in your previous slides, um, there are, as I, I mentioned already, already today, several different platforms uh, provided by the EU and, and in other contexts that uh, uh, shares information between member states for national authorities to use in individual cases. Uh, we have the IMI with the internal market information systems. We have competition networks with a lot of sharing of information and then within public procurement, within tax authorities, and in, in many different areas within EU ad administrative cooperation, there are such platforms uh, sharing information. And, and it's important to see how these uh, already existing and, and even more, even more elaborated uh, systems that will come along, how they could actually uh, adhere to these principles of good administration and transparency uh, and how these uh, information brought from these platforms can be used within national administration and still uphold these principles. Um, uh, talking as a Swede here, uh, we have for, uh, within data protection, there are, sim there are common rules and we've already discussed this a bit, but on transparency, there is not. And uh, Sweden, being a member state that always puts transparency in the forefront, uh, we have elaborated rules on how information to be used within an administrative matter uh, should be um, should be be defined and should should be um, documented. How how documents should be registered, how they should be archived, how how they could be accessed from the public and so forth. And sometimes when this information is gathered uh, from EU uh, platforms, it's not always easy to see how this could, could be upheld. And also a question for the individual concerned in an individual matter, if information is gathered, collected from several different uh, member states and then uh, collected in one platform to access uh, how, how could the, the right of the individual to be involved and have an access to information on this information to be upheld. So this is something that is, is uh, for me central uh, in this information techniques, how different national traditions could be respected uh, since these are not uh, common grounds uh, and how uh, an, an impact assessment of this kind could could be developed as to take into account or different aspects. Uh, and, and could we uh, foresee a need to have different versions of the impact assessment for different national rules? Um, another interesting question uh, that uh, also um, arises is uh, the, uh, the eventual need for iterative assessments or repetitive assessments. And, and I understand from your presentation and the information before that, this is of course not a standalone assessment. This will have to be connected to other decision-making processes within uh, the, each state and, and within the authority that uh, is, is uh, thinking of using a, a specific system. Uh, but taking that into account, uh, how could this impact assessment uh, function in relation to other uh, uh, assessments and, and systems for revocable permits or rescheduled evaluations and so forth. So uh, th that is also something that uh, it would be interesting to, to follow. Uh, the, the, the Council of Europe with Kai High Committee speaks about the AI life cycle approach and this I understand is one part of that life cycle. Um, 
So uh, summing up then, how could how to secure in the internal market and, and uphold administrative requirements uh, on the one hand, or what could also be, re be framed as uh, regulatory overload versus respect for national uh, administrative traditions. Um, can nationally adapted and repetitive evaluation be avoided? And uh, especially I, I would like to, to uh, emphasize uh, the, the dangers of having systems that is too nationally adapted. Uh, saying I, already, I just said being a Swede and our uh, bi big uh, emphasis on transparency all the time, which often clashes with the EU data protection uh, requirements, uh, it is still, even taking that into account, it is still very um, contraproductive for, for information technique and AI solutions, having to, to uh, take, to have different solutions uh, on, for different national legal arenas, uh, having the World Wide Web uh, hindered by national borders is in itself a problem that, that would, uh, would be very much, uh, should be avoided. Just to take a very simple example, uh, different ID solutions uh, for uh, bank ID and, and e-ID cards are very often can only be used within one state. Uh, as with a, a passport, <laughs> very easily you, you, you bring that with you. And, and, and these type of national IT solutions is something that, that should be overcome, especially today when our, our administra administration and the, and the uh, composite procedures are, are taking so, so, such a big step forward in, several, in many several uh, areas. It's important also to have uh, systems that could rise above the national uh, traditions. Uh, so there is a contradiction here, I'm very well aware of that, but uh, perhaps simplicity here is key, not to regulate too detailed, but to have requirements that could be translated into national traditions uh, within each state. So thank you very much and I will stop here. Thank you, uh, Professor Reichel, very much for your insights and uh, your comments. And uh, I think it's obvious that we learned from your presentation as well as by the remarks uh, from President Darak that it's very important to think about um, the overall system also uh, in, uh, in reference to the time and the ongoing learning by any sort of AI system. Um, and as you have seen on my last slide, we have that on board. We are just in the very beginning of a project. And uh, so we start with the starting period, which is the first impact assessment. And then we will go on and move on uh, about our thinking for the next steps, which are needed, of course. And another thing may be that there's probably a two tier uh, approach to that problem. Uh, the first should be that the, a, uh, that the impact assessment looks at the accountability structures with implemented with regard to that AI system. And one of those imp uh, accountability structures could be any sort of benchmarking and um, supervising the system in itself. So it's not the supervising by the AI, uh, by the impact assessment board or someone else, but by the implementing authorities. So we will see whether or not that comes out, but that's absolutely a, a very important topic you have raised. Um, I'm sure that our audience, uh, and thanks to uh, keeping your time so, so nicely, so that we now have really uh, more or less half an hour to discuss uh, further on our topic here. And uh, there's a wonderful way to do so. Uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you see there uh, a Q and A um, but, uh, menu or so, and I see that there are already two questions on board, and uh, I invite everyone else uh, to use that. If you click on that, uh, then you can 
uh, then it pops up and you can really see who is asking which questions. I will summarize as good as possible those questions and I would like to address the questions to one of our panel, one or two of our panelists. Um, so at the moment we have three questions already. Uh, the first uh, one is coming from Marc Clément, who is reported to the project. Uh, he thanks a lot to the speakers for excellent presentations. It was stressed the need to expose the evaluation. Uh, we tackled on that with the panel. Consider that update of impact assessment at a regular basis could be a solution. For instance, for high risk systems imposing a time frame or regular re evaluations, would public participation be needed in re evaluation? So, uh, Professor Reichel and President Darak, you raised this point. Now we are asking you for solutions. <laughs> Do you have any, any ideas or uh, would you leave it to us to find the, the solutions to this problem? Um, who wants to start? Uh, uh, I tried, I tried, Peter Darak. Uh, so, um, in, in the second and third question, uh, uh, that is about bureaucracy. Uh, I think uh, we, we have to avoid bureaucracy uh, in all of these uh, uh, permission uh, or impact assessment uh, procedures. So uh, to repeat um, uh, a process um, in short times, uh, that, that leads to bureaucracy. So we have to avoid it. I think that's not the solution. We, we have to uh, think about uh, uh, about some some other other ideas. Um, per, perhaps uh, uh, a duty for uh, for the AI uh, um, to oversee from time to time uh, the the amount of uh, of changes in the system. If the changes is uh, uh, um, uh, really serious. Uh, they, they should ask for, uh, for a new impact assessment uh, and an authority can decide about uh, where it is needed or not. Uh, but I, I, I'm against uh, um, an obligatory uh, repeated process. Mm -hmm. um. May I add a, a point? I, I do agree with, with, with Jess Darek that this, uh, one should avoid bureaucracy, especially if this is a system that is meant to work within several jurisdictions. Otherwise, it could be very, a uh, very heavy uh, organization around it. Um, and, and it would be definitely, if, if the assessment is to be made within one state at a time or within one authority at a time, one could easily have a situation where different authorities and different states will come to different solutions. Uh, and because I, I, as I understand from your presentation, the body to be responsible for, for performing this assessment is not necessarily a uh, EU agency or, or a, a public body, but it could be a, 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 um, a self-regulation. And obviously people, uh, different authorities would very easily be able to do different assessments. And that, that could, that could also lead to some insecurity on how, uh, how valuable uh, or how, how reliable a certain system is. But th there is a, a well-known uh, um, aspect, especially in EU law, and that is also to rely on the vigilance of the individual concerned and have a redress system. And, and that would, of course, mean to connect it to another authority or, or a court system or, or uh, accountability system already existing, uh, but that could be within the data protection uh, um, administration uh, that is also already in place, that, that if a system is not working, uh, one can complain to an already in place uh, system for redress. I think that would be uh, a better solution than to build something new for, for this uh, that depends, yeah. of course, very much how, how what steps will be taking uh, mm -hmm. onwards. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, a number of additional questions. Uh, some of you mentioned them already. Um, there is Shoshek um, asked, thank you very much for your uh, lecture. 
there are more and more frequent rumors that traditional law as a legal act is not able to control AI. Since AI is a code, shouldn't it be controlled, followed by another code? So AI supervising AI. I have actually talked with some of the Freiburg AI team, uh, which are the computer sciences in my university, which is one of the uh, top German universities, at least in, in AI. And they, computer sciences are really thinking about those things. A supervised AI, so to say, or self-supervising AI. Um, so there may be some room for that. And I wouldn't say that this would um, actually um, avoid um, the impact assessment, but it may be one of those uh, factors we should take into account in our impact assessment, whether or not there are um, accountability structures capable in order to, um, to uh, limit or to minimize the risk following from any AI, AI system. So maybe there's some, some need for that, but of course, this is only the technical way the supervising. Uh, it's not developing the standards for supervision. Uh, so we need to be very sure on that also, who is uh, thinking about the standards who really have to be applicable. And as uh, Jane, uh, I think correctly posed, uh, the standard should be good administration. And uh, if you think about that, we, it should improve good administration, AI, and it shouldn't be uh, undermine good administration. That should be our aim, I would say. Okay. Um, could the model rules introduce the criteria on how to determine whether AI poses a high risk, whether it could follow the criteria set out in the white paper? Um, Jonathan, do you have any ideas on criteria for high risk and low risk? Uh, well, we are working on the details, but we do have ideas, of course. Um, so one option would, of course, be to follow the approach by the European Commission uh, in the white paper. It basically says that you need two, uh, two um, cumulative criteria. So the first is that the system is used in an area that is actually harmful in a way or um, can pose risks. And the second is that the individual system actually poses risks. Uh, this seems quite a useful definition, um, but of course, uh, what the risks are still must be defined, um, as we said, for example, by reference to those ethics uh, documents. Another interesting approach is uh, the Canadian model, and they have a questionnaire, basically. It's an online questionnaire, and you can actually find it on the internet. It's uh, freely available. Uh, where you basically just uh, tick boxes about what the system does and then it automatically generates a risk score and tells you what the risks are and what you need to do uh, in the impact assessment. Uh, this might be uh, quite a handy solution because of course um, it removes the risk that somebody plays down the risks of the system and says, well, this is only medium risk, so uh, I don't need to do any public participation. Of course, the downside of this is that it's very formal and uh, maybe doesn't take into account each individual case. Um, so maybe it's a combination of these two. Myself, I sympathize very much with the Canadian model. And of course, we would need to ensure that the questionnaire is, uh, uh, covers all the potential problems that can arise. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we have various um, other questions now and we have uh more or less some 20 minutes uh, left. Um, so uh, I, in any event, if we can't uh, tackle all questions raised, uh, I will take a picture uh, of my screen so they will be saved because I do not know how to print or save those uh, questions online. Maybe someone else from the ELI Secretariat can do so, but I will use just my phone and make a photo of all your nice questions so that they we will Oh yes, uh, I get a notice by the ELI Secretariat, but I will get any questions uh, sent to myself anyway. So your questions are safe, uh, even if we do not have a, um, the time to discuss them in detail. Um, so one of the other questions raises uh, the problem of bureaucracy. So as we have learned from the environmental impact assessments, sometimes uh, people say uh, it's just paperwork uh, with no results on, 
on the impact. Um, on the other side, as I am also, um, I have written my doctoral thesis on environmental impact assessments. Uh, I think there is at least, uh, it's not only paperwork. It really reflects uh, or imposes um, on the um, developer of a project some ideas how to present that to the public. Even if it's a lot of paper, he has to rethink about uh, any kinds of impacts uh, on the environment. And um, the wonderful thing about environmental impact assessments is that it's uh, a holistic approach, which is really dealing with all um, we call it environmental media, uh, water, air, and so on. And I think that's also important for our impact assessment, that we need to have this, to some extent, holistic approach, not looking only on data protection, but also on impacts on the, um, on the uh, public functions and so on and so forth. Uh, how to really integrate a, um, a, a useful and helpful uh, impact assessment. And so um, I do hope if we make it correctly and we make it workable, then it will not only be bureaucracy, but it will improve how our dealing with a very new technique. Um, a very, very interesting question uh, is raised by Milan Hulmak. Uh, could you please explain how it should work together with public procurement rules and competition? The assessment is abstract without relevance to a particular system. So will it be done beforehand or will it be done after the procurement decision is made? Uh, I assume that the software is bought from private entities and the software it risks to differ. Doing the assessment before the purchase cannot assess particular AI, none knows what will be offered and finally bought. Doing the assessment after the purchase is a little useless. This is really a challenging question. And thank you very much, uh, um, Milan Olmack, for that question. We have to think about that. Um, and uh, you have raised the two bottom lines we have here. Uh, is anyone else on the on the um, panel have some thoughts on that problem. Does anyone volunteer? Uh, may I, I, I was thinking about something that also has come from the environmental side uh, about, about this marking that a product is environmental friendly. Uh, there are a lot of different schemes for that. So in, in a way, especially if this is, the, the, this is an a, a, a independent self-regulatory mechanism there could be some sort of marking that this product has been assessed and been been uh, uh, found to be in, in compa compatibility with uh, th these ethical uh, rules and that would be already when it's on the market or, or shortly after which would be then independent of, of any specific uh, um, uh, purchase from from uh, from uh, an, uh, an authority mm. so that could be an idea. Okay. Well, we might introduce into the procurement, uh, so to say, uh, um, uh, uh, a condition that anyone is only able to be um, purchased uh, if he uh, subscribed to the afterwards uh, impact assessment and the results following from that. So uh, that might be also a solution. But we will think about uh, those things. Um, we will see. Um, if anyone else is following our now 10 uh, questions, uh, please take any question you would like to answer, uh, because there are so many of them already. Transparency, participation. Um, so there's one by Anna Simonata, and I would address that probably to Katarzyna. Um, I would like to you know about two issues. The first relates to transparency, participation. Perhaps in the model rules, attention should be paid to the need for adding to technical documents an explanation in more simple words in order to allow each other comprehension between different groups of experts and to the public as well. Katarzyna, do you have a view on that? Uh, yes, I believe this is very important because, uh, as I mentioned in my short presentation, we want, especially the public consultation part, to be as accessible as possible. So this is very important. I think this is crucial to, to effectively introduce that, that accessibility 
So the, the documents that, sub, that are subject to um, public consultation could be understandable for, for people who consult on them. So not only for scientific experts, but it is crucial to build the trust that we already mentioned today. It is crucial for the everyday people to understand how the system works and what can it do, what can it does, yeah. Thank you. Okay, then we have questions concerning uh, the problems which are also tackled, I think, to some extent by Professor Reichel um, with regard to European wide networks or information networks implementing uh, any sort of AI tool. And who is really responsible? Is it the European Union which imposes the need to implement those, uh, uh, these information systems or are all the member states in addition or on their own uh, responsible for any impact assessment. And um, we may have the same problems uh, within any kind of federal state where the central of our government is uh, implementing um, a certain system which is then used by many, many bodies within that state. So it's each body um, uh, used uh, or does it need to make its own impact assessment or can they trust on an impact assessment made by the central um, central um, body. Uh, we haven't thought on that at the end because we are in the, in the starting period. We will take that on board. My first thinking would be uh, that we shouldn't have uh, in the situation of the European Union 28 impact assessments for any kind of EMI system or something like that. One from the EU and then the 27 member states. Um, but of course, we need to, um, to integrate the views by all various, uh, uh, by all the various member states uh, in such a, a European-wide impact assessment. So we need to have stakeholders and the public authorities in the member states who are forced to use that, uh, that new uh, system, they need to have a chance to uh, give their view on that system. So we do not be, this public consultation may also be a consultation of stakeholders. And again, Katarzyna, would you have the idea that this fits to our stage of thinking at the moment? Yes, absolutely. I think that in our projects, we have those little parts that can help adapt um, this impact assessment uh, process to the specific needs of a certain member state. So this is, this is one thing that if we consult with different stakeholders, this is um, a part of the, of the process that we can adapt to this specific situation. The same with, with experts. If we think about, for example, different legislations, so different administrative legal systems in different member states, the expert will not only should not only have um, expertise on the system, on the, the workings of AI, but also there should be legal experts that understand how the administration in that member state works in order to create um, a comprehensive uh, audit report. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Then we have questions. Um, we have, I think, um, interesting perspectives on bureaucracy. Some have a fear of bureaucracy and say, we need to have at least a certain amount of bureaucracy, and that's probably true. We can't say that impact assessment will be without any sort of bureaucracy, but we need to have a correct level on that. Uh, President Darak, do you have, from your perspective and experiences, uh, some view uh, how we can adapt uh, a correct level on bureaucracy on that? Um, yes, uh, I had an idea. Uh, uh, there is uh, no system, uh, no uh, remedy system, which uh, could work without uh, personal interests and complaints. So uh, we need very much the public uh, participation in, in this process. Uh, I have the experience in environmental cases uh, in Hungary uh, when uh, there is a real personal uh, representation in these uh, uh, processes, uh, then 
also the authorities are more motivated to research, to, to uh, investigate uh, in the case. Uh, so uh, the problem is that in, uh, in software cases, in, in uh, um, artificial intelligence cases, everybody, every citizen uh, are a layman. So uh, uh, it's a bit similar uh, uh, like we had in the environmental cases, cases in the 70s, 80s, when the first associations uh, were founded uh, to give uh, a professional help to people, uh, to average people in their cases. I think that will be the trend also in, in AI cases that will we have uh, civil society, civil associations, uh, which will be specialized uh, uh, in AI cases, in algorithm uh, cases, and they could help uh, to people who have uh, only a simple personal problem uh, with using their data, with recognizing their face uh, on the streets, uh, and uh, um, on, the, on the way of, uh, of this professional help, uh, we can bring uh, the public participation uh, effectively in the impact assessment uh, uh, procedures too. So without uh, uh, a strong public participation, uh, I think uh, the danger is, 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 is great uh, to have a bureaucratic uh, impact assessment procedure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we have uh, some other points. One would be uh, on the role of data protection officers or something alike. Uh, so uh, this Lisba Tesansko asked, my question is, do you see at that stage the need for a concept function role similar to a data protection officer? So an impact assessment officer or something like that at public administrative authorities bodies who would oversee the ethical and legal aspects of the assessment, application, and evolution of AI solutions in practice. Um, and again, given that AI would be self-learning. So uh, probably our answer would be um, that whether or not there's such a role implemented in the authority is a question whether or not there's a correct accountability structure. That would be my answer. And the more risky, and the system is, the more structures like that we need. If it's very low risk, there's no need for a special uh, role like that. But in high risk uh, systems, we need to have someone who is taking account of such a specific risk. And so um, the other more interesting or also very interesting um, question connected to that, do we need something in addition to the data protection officer? Or can we say uh, this specific um, perspective on the risk of data processing via AI is also part of that task? And so we do not have to reinvent the wheel to some extent, um, but just to elaborate a little bit more what is the role. And then it's for the impact assessment to say um, what we need. Jonathan, do you have an idea on that? Because uh, we have at least um, in our model rules, you will see at the very end a notion, or we will probably restructure it and put it in, in the beginning, about the, uh, the connection between the impact assessment uh, according to our rules with regard to the impact assessments under the GDPR. Um, yes, so the, the, the data protection impact assessment uh, does definitely have its limits. Uh, first of all, uh, of course, the GDPR only applies when personal data is processed. Personal data only relates to natural persons. So, for example, everything you do in the sector of finance or business may not be covered adequately by data protection rules because you deal mostly with legal persons. Um, and also the risks uh, we assess, it's somewhat unclear what the data protection assessment does um, and how far these risks to the protection of personal data uh, cover the risks of AI, um, especially since AI not only uh, uses personal data, as, as we mentioned, for example, predictive policing uh, can be done when you simply look at how much crime was committed in a specific area 
and this can still pose risks of discrimination because if the police always goes to one area where they think uh, there is much crime, they will probably discriminate against the inhabitants of that area. And this may very well uh, amount to racial profiling and all these uh, things we discussed so much. So I think we do need an extension uh, or the, the data protection impact assessment does not do enough. Uh, but coming back to the question of having an officer, personally, I think it would be reasonable to uh, start with that officer because they already have an idea uh, of problems and it's easier to teach them to think about additional problems related to AI than in inventing a wholly new post. It may also be necessary, however, to have a central uh, expert bodies, uh, say at a state level or national level, um, who have real expertise and uh, professionals who deal with these problems only, uh, so they can advise the uh, individual public authorities. Okay. So you mean the, the local ones, so to say, yeah. Okay, um, now we, I would, I think I have two questions, one for um, Professor Reichel and one for um, President Darak. Uh, the first one uh, for um, Professor Reichel is, uh, how do we uh, tackle the problem of discriminatory data used by the AI system? And how do you see any, uh, any safeguards against that? And uh, for uh, President Darak, uh, we received the very last question. Um, I'd like to uh, ask the group uh, um, whether it intends to focus on that delicate branch of public administration that is justice. So algorithms apply to judicial decision making. What do you think about that? So Professor Reichel, you first and then President Darak. Thank you very much for an interesting question. As I, I think that when dealing with AI and the, these type of, of issues, it's important to not build a separate legal system applicable to AI, but to fall back on, on the general law, the general constitutional administrative and, and other principles that, that we have. And here I would say that discrimination in AI as discrimination otherwise should be dealt with uh, via principle of um, impartiality and, and objectivity that, that are crucial to, to good administration and, and, and uh, uh, public law under, uh, uh, under the rule of law. And, th and this must be applied in a AI systems as in any other legal area. Of course, uh, it, as in any other legal area, it has to be, it has to be adapted to the specific uh, scenarios and the specific issues and specific questions. And here, um, I think this is where the impact assessment is, is really valuable because this is built into the system. And once it's there, it's much more difficult because the lawyers and the administrator will look at the outcome. They won't look at, at how this, the information got there. So, so I think uh, that, that is one of the key issues for this project, how to include impartiality, objectivity, the transparency, and all these constitutional values within the assessment. Okay, thank you very much. We so, have high hopes. <laughs> yeah. So for our last minute or so, uh, the word is for you. The floor is yours, uh, President Darak. How about AI and the justice system? <laughs> uh, yes, that's not simple, but uh, if you see uh, the example of uh, self-driven cars, uh, the responsibility of, uh, of uh, driving uh, such a car. Uh, the law uh, leads always uh, back the responsibility for a natural person uh, in, in these cases, um, uh, not speaking about uh, the uh, responsibility or liability of, of corporations, of course, but uh, we have the natural person behind all acts. Uh, of course, that's uh, more and more a fiction uh, uh, in the real life, but because if there is a uh, AI system which acts uh, and uh, there is a permission and there was an impact assessment procedure which uh, allowed to uh, acting for this system, uh, it's, it's really difficult to find this nature of person who is liable for, for a harm for uh, some remedies. So I, I think when we have one man and one 
self-driving car, that's the simplest case. When we have a whole system for the state administration, uh, we, we can't say that the, the prime minister or uh, the, the minister of interior is uh, responsible for any harm of uh, 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 causing by this system. That will be a new question for the whole uh, law system of the nations, uh, what to do with. Uh, in, in such cases, um, also uh, in an example from environmental law, uh, we we need a common uh, security system, a common uh, fund for uh, for these remedies, uh, which uh, uh, divides uh, all all the, the remedies uh, among all citizens of the state. So I think that's that's the only one uh, uh, working uh, um, method or construction uh, for uh, dealing with these cases. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I thank all the panelists uh, for helping me uh, conducting this uh, webinar so effectively. And I thank all uh, the participants in our discussions who raised questions uh, via our question uh, and answer system. And as you have learned, I will be provided with all questions, even those uh, with I haven't uh, uh, indicated uh, during uh, our session now and the team will take all your questions on board and of course uh, we will be happy uh, to be informed about any other topics you have. You will find us easily and uh, you will find ways to contact us and the team. Um, so thank you very much and have a good day and a lot of interesting discussions within the other webinars of this annual conference. Thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>